Chapter 19 of Robinson Crusoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Chapter 19 Return to England. Having done all this, I left them the next day and went on board the ship. We prepared immediately to sail, but did not weigh that night. The next morning early, two of the five men came swimming to the ship's side, and making the most lamentable complaint of the other three, begged to be taken into the ship for God's sake, for they should be murdered, and begged the captain to take them on board, though he hanged them immediately. Upon this the captain pretended to have no power without me, but after some difficulty, and after their solemn promises of amendment, they were taken on board, and were, some time after, soundly whipped and pickled, after which they proved very honest and quiet fellows. Some time after this the boat was ordered on shore, the tide being up, with the things promised to the men, to which the captain, at my intercession, caused their chests and clothes to be added, which they took, and were very thankful for. I also encouraged them, by telling them that if it lay in my power to send any vessel to take them in, I would not forget them. When I took leave of this island I carried on board, for relics, the great goatskin cap I had made, my umbrella, and one of my parrots. Also I forgot not to take the money I formerly mentioned, which had lain by me so long useless that it was grown rusty or tarnished, and could hardly pass for silver till it had been a little rubbed and handled, as also the money I found in the wreck of the Spanish ship. And thus I left the island, the 19th of December, as I found by the ship's account, in the year 1686, after I had been upon it eight and twenty years, two months, and nineteen days, being delivered from this second captivity the same day of the month that I first made my escape in the longboat from among the moors of Sally. In this vessel, after a long voyage, I arrived in England the 11th of June, in the year 1687, having been thirty-five years absent. When I came to England I was as perfect a stranger to all the world as if I had never been known there. My benefactor and faithful steward, whom I had left my money in trust with, was alive, but had had great misfortunes in the world, was become a widow the second time, and very low in the world. I made her very easy as to what she owed me, assuring her I would give her no trouble. But, on the contrary, in gratitude for her former care and faithfulness to me, I relieved her as my little stock would afford, which at that time would, indeed, allow me to do but little for her, but I assured her I would never forget her former kindness to me, nor did I forget her when I had sufficient to help her, as shall be observed in its proper place. I went down afterwards into Yorkshire, but my father was dead, and my mother and all the family extinct, except that I found two sisters, and two of the children of one of my brothers, and as I had been long ago given over for dead, there had been no provision made for me, so that, in a word, I found nothing to relieve or assist me, and that the little money I had would not do much for me as to settling in the world. I met with one piece of gratitude indeed, which I did not expect, and this was, that the master of the ship, whom I had so happily delivered, and by the same means saved the ship and cargo, having given a very handsome account to the owners of the manner how I had saved the lives of the men and the ship, they invited me to meet them and some other merchants concerned, and altogether made me a very handsome compliment upon the subject, and a present of almost two hundred pounds sterling. But after making several reflections upon the circumstances of my life, and how little way this would go towards settling me in the world, I resolved to go to Lisbon, and see if I might not come at some information of the state of my plantation in the Brazils, and of what was become of my partner, who, I had reason to suppose, had some years past given me over for dead. With this view I took shipping for Lisbon, where I arrived in April following, my man Friday accompanying me very honestly in all these ramblings, and proving a most faithful servant upon all occasions. When I came to Lisbon I found out, by inquiry, and to my particular satisfaction, my old friend, the captain of the ship who first took me up at sea off the shore of Africa. He was now grown old, and had left off going to sea, having put his son, 
who was far from a young man, into his ship, and who still used the Brazil trade. The old man did not know me, and indeed <laughs> I hardly knew him. But I soon brought him to my remembrance, and as soon brought myself to his remembrance, when I told him who I was. After some passionate expressions of the old acquaintance between us, I inquired, you may be sure, after my plantation and my partner. The old man told me he had not been in the Brazils for about nine years, but that he could assure me that when he came away my partner was living, but the trustees whom I had joined with him to take cognizance of my part were both dead. That, however, he believed I would have a very good account of the improvement of the plantation, for that, upon the general belief of my being cast away and drowned, my trustees had given in the account of the produce of my part of the plantation to the procurator fiscal, who had appropriated it, in case I never came to claim it, one-third to the king and two-thirds to the monastery of St. Augustine, to be expended for the benefit of the poor, and for the conversion of the Indians to the Catholic faith. But that, if I appeared, or any one for me, to claim the inheritance, it would be restored, only that the improvement or annual production, being distributed to charitable uses, could not be restored. But he assured me that the steward of the king's revenue from lands, and the providore, or steward of the monastery, had taken great care all along that the incumbent, that is to say, my partner, gave every year a faithful account of the produce, of which they had duly received my moiety. I asked him if he knew to what height of improvement he had brought the plantation, and whether he thought it might be worth looking after, or whether, on my going thither, I should meet with any obstruction to my possessing my just right in the moiety. He told me he could not tell exactly to what degree the plantation was improved, but this he knew, that my partner was grown exceeding rich upon the enjoying of his part of it, and that, to the best of his remembrance, he had heard that the king's third of my part, which was, it seems, granted away to some other monastery or religious house, amounted to above two hundred moidores a year. That as to my being restored to a quiet possession of it, there was no question to be made of that, my partner being alive to witness my title, and my name being also enrolled in the register of the country. Also he told me that the survivors of my two trustees were very fair, honest people, and very wealthy, and he believed I would not only have their assistance for putting me in possession, but would find a very considerable sum of money in their hands for my account, being the produce of the farm, while their fathers held the trust, and before it was given up as above, which, as he remembered, was for about twelve years. I showed myself a little concerned and uneasy at this account, and inquired of the old captain how it came to pass that the trustee should thus dispose of my effects, when he knew that I had made my will, and had made him, the Portuguese captain, my universal heir, etc. He told me that was true, but that as there was no proof of my being dead, he could not act as executor until some certain account should come of my death and besides he was not willing to intermeddle with a thing so remote. That it was true he had registered my will, and put in his claim, and could he have given any account of my being dead or alive, he would have acted by procuration, and taken possession of the ingenio, so they call the sugar-house, and have given his son, who was now at the Brazils, orders to do it. But, says the old man, I have one piece of news to tell you, which perhaps may not be so acceptable to you as the rest. And that is, believing you were lost, and all the world believing so also, your partner and trustees did offer to account with me, in your name, for the first six or eight years' profits, which I received. There being at that time great disbursements for increasing the works, building an ingenio, and buying slaves, it did not amount to near so much as afterwards it produced. However, says the old man, I shall give you a true account of what I have received in all, and how I have disposed of it. After a few days' further conference with this ancient friend, he brought me an account of the first six years' income of my plantation, signed by my partner and the merchant trustees, being always delivered in goods, that is, tobacco in roll, and sugar in chests, besides rum, molasses, etc., 
which is the consequence of a sugar-work, and I found by this account that every year the income considerably increased, but, as above, the disbursements being large, the sum at first was small. However, the old man let me see that he was debtor to me four hundred and seventy moidores of gold, besides sixty chests of sugar and fifteen double rolls of tobacco, which were lost in his ship. He having been shipwrecked coming home to Lisbon about eleven years after my having the place. The good man then began to complain about his misfortunes, and how he had been obliged to make use of my money to recover his losses, and buy him a share in a new ship. However, my old friend, says he, you shall not want a supply in your necessity, and as soon as my son returns, you shall be fully satisfied. Upon this he pulls out an old pouch, and gives me one hundred and sixty Portugal moidores in gold, and giving the writings of his title to the ship, which his son was gone to the Brazils in, of which he was quarter part owner, and his son another, he puts them both into my hands for security of the rest. I was too much moved with the honesty and kindness of the poor man to be able to bear this, and remembering what he had done for me, how he had taken me up at sea, and how generously he had used me on all occasions, and particularly how sincere a friend he was now to me, I could hardly refrain weeping at what he had said to me. Therefore I asked him if his circumstances admitted him to spare so much money at that time, and if it would not straighten him. He told me he could not say, but it might straighten him a little. But, however, it was my money, and I might want it more than he. Everything the good man said was full of affection, and I could hardly refrain from tears while he spoke. In short, I took one hundred of the moidores, and called for a pen and ink to give him a receipt for them. Then I returned him the rest, and told him if ever I had possession of the plantation, I would return the other to him also, as indeed I afterwards did, and that as to the bill of sale of his part in his son's ship, I would not take it by any means, but that if I wanted the money, I found he was honest enough to pay me, and if I did not, but came to receive what he gave me reason to expect, I would never have a penny more from him. When this was passed, the old man asked me if he should put me into a method to make my claim to my plantation. I told him I thought to go over to it myself. He said I might do so, if I pleased, but that if I did not, there were ways enough to secure my right, and immediately to appropriate the profits to my use. And as there were ships in the river of Lisbon just ready to go away to Brazil, he made me enter my name in a public register, with his affidavit, affirming upon oath that I was alive, and that I was the same person who took up the land for the planting the said plantation at first. This being regularly attested by a notary, and a procuration affixed, he directed me to send it, with a letter of his writing, to a merchant of his acquaintance at the place, and then proposed my staying with him till an account came of the return. Never was anything more honourable than the proceedings upon this procuration, for in less than seven months I received a large packet from the survivors of my trustees, the merchants, for whose account I went to see, in which were the following particular letters and papers enclosed. First, there was the account current of the produce of my farm or plantation, from the year when their fathers had balanced with my old Portugal captain, being for six years. The balance appeared to be one thousand one hundred and seventy-four moidores in my favour. Secondly, there was the account of four years more, while they kept the effects in their hands, before the government claimed the administration, as being the effects of a person not to be found, which they called civil death, and the balance of this, the value of the plantation increasing, amounted to nineteen thousand four hundred and forty-six cruzados being about three thousand two hundred and forty moidores. Thirdly, there was the prior of St. Augustine's account, who had received the profits for above fourteen years, but not being able to account for what was disposed of by the hospital, very honestly declared he had eight hundred and seventy-two moidores not distributed, which he acknowledged to my account. As to the king's part, that refunded nothing." 
There was a letter of my partner's, congratulating me very affectionately upon my being alive, giving me an account how the estate was improved, and what it produced a year, with the particulars of the number of squares, or acres, that it contained, how planted, how many slaves there were upon it, and making two and twenty crosses for blessings, told me he had said so many Ave Marias to thank the Blessed Virgin that I was alive, inviting me very passionately to come over and take possession of my own, and in the meantime to give him orders to whom he should deliver my effects if I did not come myself, concluding with a hearty tender of his friendship and that of his family, and sent me as a present seven fine leopard skins, which he had, it seems, received from Africa, by some other ship than he had sent thither, and which, it seems, had made a better voyage than I. He sent me also five chests of excellent sweetmeats, and a hundred pieces of gold uncoined, not quite so large as Moidores. By the same fleet my two merchant trustees shipped me one thousand two hundred chests of sugar, eight hundred rolls of tobacco, and the rest of the whole account in gold. I might well say now, indeed, that the latter end of Job was better than the beginning. It is impossible to express the flutterings of my very heart when I found all my wealth about me, for as the Brazil ships come all in fleets, the same ships which brought my letters brought my goods, and the effects were safe in the river before the letters came to my hand. In a word, I turned pale and grew sick, and, had not the old man run and fetched me a cordial, I believe the sudden surprise of joy had overset nature, and I had died upon the spot. Nay, after that, I continued very ill, and was so some hours, till a physician being sent for, and something of the real cause of my illness being known, he ordered me to be let blood, after which I had relief, and grew well. But I verily believe, if I had not been eased by event given in that manner to the spirits, I should have died." I was now master, all on a sudden, of about five thousand pounds sterling in money, and had an estate, as I might well call it, in the Brazils, of above a thousand pounds a year, as sure as an estate of lands in England, and, in a word, I was in a condition which I scarce knew how to understand, or how to compose myself for the enjoyment of it. The first thing I did was to recompense my original benefactor, my good old captain, who had been first charitable to me in my distress, kind to me in my beginning, and honest to me at the end. I showed him all that was sent to me. I told him that, next to the providence of heaven which disposed all things, it was owing to him, and that it now lay on me to reward him, which I would do a hundredfold. So I first returned to him the hundred moidores I had received of him, then I sent for a notary, and caused him to draw up a general release or discharge from the four hundred and seventy moidores, which he had acknowledged he owed me, in the fullest and firmest manner possible. After which I caused a procuration to be drawn, empowering him to be the receiver of the annual profits of my plantation, and appointing my partner to account with him, and make the returns, by the usual fleets, to him in my name and by a clause in the end made a grant of one hundred moidores a year to him during his life, out of the effects, and fifty moidores a year to his son after him, for his life, and thus I requited my old man. I had now to consider which way to steer my course next, and what to do with the estate that Providence had thus put into my hands, and indeed I had more care upon my head now than I had in my state of life in the island for I wanted nothing but what I had, and had nothing but what I wanted. Whereas I had now a great charge upon me, and my business was how to secure it. I had not a cave now to hide my money in, or a place where it might lie without lock or key, till it grew mouldy and tarnished before anybody would meddle with it. On the contrary, I knew not where to put it, or whom to trust with it. My old patron, the captain, indeed, was honest, and that was the only refuge I had. In the next place, my interest in the Brazils seemed to summon me thither, but now I could not tell how to think of going thither till I had settled my affairs, and left my effects in some safe hands behind me. At first I thought of my old friend the widow, who I knew was honest, and would be just to me, but then she was in years, and but poor, and for aught I knew, might be in debt. 
so that, in a word, I had no way but to go back to England myself and take my effects with me. It was some months, however, before I resolved upon this, and therefore, as I had rewarded the old captain fully, and to his satisfaction, who had been my former benefactor, so I began to think of the poor widow, whose husband had been my first benefactor, and she, while it was in her power, my faithful steward and instructor. So the first thing I did I got a merchant in Lisbon to write to his correspondent in London, not only to pay a bill, but to go find her out and carry her, in money, a hundred pounds from me, and to talk with her and comfort her in her poverty, by telling her she should, if I lived, have a further supply. At the same time I sent my two sisters in the country a hundred pounds each, they being, though not in want, yet not in very good circumstances, one having been married and left a widow, and the other having a husband not so kind to her as he should be. But among all my relations or acquaintances I could not yet pitch upon one to whom I durst commit the gross of my stock, that I might go away to the Brazils, and leave things safe behind me, and this greatly perplexed me. I had once a mind to have gone to the Brazils and have settled myself there, for I was, as it were, naturalized to the place, but I had some little scruple in my mind about religion, which insensibly drew me back. However, it was not religion that kept me from going there for the present, and as I had made no scruple of being openly of the religion of the country all the while I was among them, so neither did I yet, only that, now and then, having of late thought more of it than formerly, when I began to think of living and dying among them, I began to regret having professed myself a papist, and thought it might not be the best religion to die with. But, as I have said, this was not the main thing that kept me from going to the Brazils, but that really I did not know with whom to leave my effects behind me. So I resolved at last to go to England, where, if I arrived, I concluded that I should make some acquaintance, or find some relations that would be faithful to me, and accordingly I prepared to go to England with all my wealth. In order to prepare things for my going home, I first, the Brazil fleet being just going away, resolved to give answers suitable to the just and faithful account of things I had from thence, and, first, to the prior of St. Augustine, I wrote a letter full of thanks for his just dealings, and the offer of the eight hundred and seventy-two moidores which were undisposed of, which I desired might be given, five hundred to the monastery, and three hundred and seventy-two to the poor, as the prior should direct, desiring the good padre's prayers for me, and the like. I wrote next a letter of thanks to my two trustees, with all the acknowledgment that so much justice and honesty called for. As for sending them any present, they were far above having any occasion of it. Lastly, I wrote to my partner, acknowledging his industry in the improving of the plantation, and his integrity in increasing the stock of the works, giving him instructions for his future government of my part, according to the powers I had left with my old patron, to whom I desired him to send whatever became due to me, till he should hear from me more particularly, assuring him that it was my intention not only to come to him, but to settle myself there for the remainder of my life. To this I added a very handsome present of some Italian silks for his wife and two daughters, for such the captain's son informed me he had, with two pieces of fine English broadcloth, the best I could get in Lisbon, five pieces of black bays, and some Flanders lace of a good value. Having thus settled my affairs, sold my cargo, and turned all my effects into good bills of exchange, my next difficulty was which way to go to England. I had been accustomed enough to the sea, and yet I had a strange aversion to go to England by the sea at that time, and yet I could give no reason for it. Yet the difficulty increased upon me so much, that though I had once shipped my baggage in order to go, yet I altered my mind, and that not once, but two or three times. It is true I had been very unfortunate by sea, and this might be one of the reasons. But let no man slight the strong impulses of his own thoughts in cases of such moment. Two of the ships which I had singled out to go in, I mean more particularly singled out than any other, having put my things on board one of them, and in the other having agreed with the captain, 
I say two of these ships miscarried. One was taken by the Algerines, and the other was lost on the start, near Torbay, and all the people drowned except three, so that in either of those vessels I had been made miserable. Having been thus harassed in my thoughts, my old pilot, to whom I communicated everything, pressed me earnestly not to go by sea, but either to go by land to the Groin, and cross over the Bay of Biscay to Rochelle, from whence it was but an easy and safe journey by land to Paris, and so to Calais and Dover, or to go up to Madrid, and so all the way by land through France. In a word, I was so prepossessed against my going by sea at all, except from Calais to Dover, that I resolved to travel all the way by land, which, as I was not in haste, and did not value the charge, was by much the pleasanter way. And to make it more so, my old captain brought an English gentleman, the son of a merchant in Lisbon, who was willing to travel with me, after which we picked up two more English merchants also, and two young Portuguese gentlemen, the last going to Paris only, so that in all there were six of us and five servants, the two merchants and the two Portuguese contenting themselves with one servant between two, to save the charge. And as for me, I got an English sailor to travel with me as a servant, besides my man Friday, who was too much a stranger to be capable of supplying the place of a servant on the road. In this manner I set out from Lisbon, and our company being very well mounted and armed, we made a little troop, whereof they did me the honour to call me Captain, as well because I was the oldest man as because I had two servants, and indeed was the origin of the whole journey. As I have troubled you with none of my sea journals, so I shall trouble you now with none of my land journals, but some adventures that happened to us in this tedious and difficult journey I must not omit. When we came to Madrid, we, being all of us strangers to Spain, were willing to stay some time to see the court of Spain, and what was worth observing. But it being the latter part of the summer, we hastened away, and set out from Madrid about the middle of October, but when we came to the edge of Navarre, we were alarmed, at several towns on the way, with an account that so much snow was falling on the French side of the mountains, that several travellers were obliged to come back to Pampelona, after having attempted at an extreme hazard to pass on. When we came to Pampeluna itself, we found it so indeed, and to me, that had been always used to a hot climate, and to countries where I could scarce bear any clothes on, the cold was insufferable. Nor, indeed, was it more painful than surprising to come but ten days before out of old Castile, where the weather was not only warm but very hot, and immediately to feel a wind from the Pyrenean mountains so very keen, so severely cold, as to be intolerable, and to endanger benumbing and perishing of our fingers and toes. Poor Friday was really frightened when he saw the mountains all covered with snow, and felt cold weather, which he had never seen or felt before in his life. To mend the matter, when we came to Pampeluna it continued snowing with so much violence and so long, that the people said winter was come before its time, and the roads, which were difficult before, were now quite impassable. For, in a word, the snow lay in some places too thick for us to travel, and being not hard frozen, as is the case in the northern countries, there was no going without being in danger of being buried alive every step. We stayed no less than twenty days at Pampeluna, when, seeing the winter coming on, and no likelihood of its being better, for it was the severest winter all over Europe that had been known in the memory of man, I proposed that we should go away to Fontarabia, and there take shipping for Bordeaux, which was a very little voyage. But while I was considering this, there came in four French gentlemen, who, having been stopped on the French side of the passes, as we were on the Spanish, had found out a guide, who, traversing the country near the head of Languedoc, had brought them over the mountains by such ways that they were not much incommoded with the snow for where they met with snow in any quantity, they said it was frozen hard enough to bear them and their horses. We sent for this guide, who told us he would undertake to carry us the same way, with no hazard from the snow, provided we were armed sufficiently to protect ourselves from wild beasts, for, he said, in these great snows it was frequent for some wolves to show themselves at the foot of the mountains, 
being made ravenous for want of food, the ground being covered with snow. We told him we were well enough prepared for such creatures as they were, if he would ensure us from a kind of two-legged wolves, which we were told we were in most danger from, especially on the French side of the mountains. He satisfied us that there was no danger of that kind in the way that we were to go, so we readily agreed to follow him, as did also twelve other gentlemen with their servants, some French, some Spanish, who, as I said, had attempted to go, and were obliged to come back again. Accordingly, we set out from Pampeluna with our guide on the 15th of November, and indeed I was surprised when, instead of going forward, he came directly back with us on the same road that we came from Madrid, about twenty miles, when, having passed two rivers, and come into the plain country, we found ourselves in a warm climate again, where the country was pleasant, and no snow to be seen. But on a sudden, turning to his left, he approached the mountains another way, and though it is true the hills and precipices looked dreadful, yet he made so many tours, such meanders, and led us by such winding ways, that we insensibly passed the height of the mountains, without being much encumbered with the snow. And all on a sudden he showed us the pleasant and fruitful provinces of Languedoc and Gascony, all green and flourishing, though at a great distance, and we had some rough way to pass still. We were a little uneasy, however, when we found it snowed one whole day and a night so fast that we could not travel. But he bid us be easy, we should soon be past it all. We found, indeed, that we began to descend every day, and to come more north than before, and so, depending upon our guide, we went on. It was about two hours before night, when, our guide being something before us, and not just in sight, out rushed three monstrous wolves, and after them a bear, from a hollow way adjoining to a thick wood. Two of the wolves made at the guide, and had he been far before us, he would have been devoured before we could have helped him. One of them fastened upon his horse, and the other attacked the man with such violence that he had not time or presence of mind enough to draw his pistol but hallooed and cried out to us most lustily. My man Friday being next me, I bade him ride up and see what was the matter. As soon as Friday came in sight of the man, he hallooed out as loud as the other, "'Ho, oh, master! Ho, oh, master!' But like a bold fellow, rode directly up to the poor man, and with his pistol shot the wolf in the head that attacked him. It was happy for the poor man that it was my man Friday, for having been used to such creatures in his country, he had no fear upon him, but went close up to him and shot him, whereas any other of us would have fired at a farther distance, and have perhaps either missed the wolf or endangered shooting the man. But it was enough to have terrified a bolder man than I, and indeed it alarmed all our company when, with the noise of Friday's pistol, we heard on both sides the most dismal howling of wolves, and the noise, redoubled by the echo of the mountains, appeared to us as if there had been a prodigious number of them. And perhaps there was not such a few as that we had no cause of apprehension. However, as Friday had killed this wolf, the other that had fastened upon the horse left him immediately and fled, without doing him any damage, having happily fastened upon his head, where the bosses of the bridle had stuck in his teeth. But the man was most hurt, for the raging creature had bit him twice, once in the arm, and the other time a little above his knee, and though he had made some defence, he was just tumbling down by the disorder of his horse, when Friday came up and shot the wolf. It is easy to suppose that at the noise of Friday's pistol we all mended our pace, and rode up as fast as the way, which was very difficult, would give us leave to see what was the matter. As soon as we came clear of the trees, which blinded us before, we saw clearly what had been the case, and how Friday had disengaged the poor guide, though we did not presently discern what kind of creature it was he had killed. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 The Final Chapter of Robinson Crusoe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe 
by Daniel Defoe. Chapter 20. Fight Between Friday and a Bear. But never was a fight managed so heartily and in such a surprising manner as that which followed between Friday and the bear, which gave us all, though at first we were surprised and afraid for him, the greatest diversion imaginable. As the bear is a heavy, clumsy creature, and does not gallop as the wolf does, who is swift and light, so he has two particular qualities, which generally are the rule of his actions. First, as to men, who are not his proper prey, he does not usually attempt them, except they first attack him, unless he be excessively hungry, which it is probable might now be the case, the ground being covered with snow. If you do not meddle with him, he will not meddle with you but then you must take care to be very civil to him, and give him the road, for he is a very nice gentleman. He will not go a step out of his way for a prince. Nay, if you are really afraid, your best way is to look another way and keep going on, for sometimes if you stop and stand still, and look steadfastly at him, he takes it for an affront. But if you throw or toss anything at him, though it were but a bit of stick as big as your finger, he thinks himself abused, and sets all other business aside to pursue his revenge, and will have satisfaction in point of honour. That is his first quality. The next is, if he be once affronted, he will never leave you, night or day, till he has his revenge, but follows at a good round rate till he overtakes you. My man Friday had delivered our guide, and when we came up to him he was helping him off his horse, for the man was both hurt and frightened, when on a sudden we espied the bear come out of the wood, and a monstrous one it was, the biggest by far that ever I saw. We were all a little surprised when we saw him, but when Friday saw him, it was easy to see joy and courage in the fellow's countenance. "'Oh, oh, oh!' says Friday, three times, pointing to him. "'Oh, master, you give me to leave, me shake it a hand with him, me make a you good laugh!' I was surprised to see the fellow so well pleased. "'You fool,' says I, "'he will eat you up.' "'Eat a me up, eat a me up,' says Friday, twice over again. "'Me eat a him up, me make a you good laugh. You all stay here, me show you good laugh.' So down he sits, and gets off his boots in a moment, and puts on a pair of pumps, as we call the flat shoes they wear, and which he had in his pocket, gives my other servant his horse, and with his gun away he flew, swift like the wind. The bear was walking softly on, and offered to meddle with nobody, till Friday coming pretty near, calls to him, as if the bear could understand him. "'Hark ye, hark ye,' says Friday, "'me speak it with you.' We followed at a distance, for now, being down on the Gascony side of the mountains, we were entered a vast forest, where the country was plain and pretty open, though it had many trees in it scattered here and there. Friday, who had, as we say, the heels of the bear, came up with him quickly, and took up a great stone and threw it at him, and hit him just on the head, but did him no more harm than if he had thrown it against a wall. But it answered Friday's end, for the rogue was so void of fear that he did it purely to make the bear follow him, and show us some laugh, as he called it. As soon as the bear felt the blow, and saw him, he turns about and comes after him, taking very long strides, and shuffling on at a strange rate, so as would have put a horse to a middling gallop. Away reigns Friday, and takes his course as if he ran towards us for help. So we all resolved to fire at once upon the bear, and deliver my man. Though I was angry at him for bringing the bear back upon us, when he was going about his own business another way, and especially I was angry that he had turned the bear upon us, and then ran away, and I called out, "'You dog, is this your making us laugh? Come away and take your horse, that we may shoot the creature.' He heard me and cried out, "'No shoot, no shoot! Stand still, and you get much laugh!' And as the nimble creature ran two feet for the bear's one, he turned on a sudden on one side of us, and seeing a great oak tree fit for his purpose, he beckoned to us to follow, and doubling his pace, he got nimbly up the tree, laying his gun down upon the ground, at about five or six yards from the bottom of the tree. The bear soon came to the tree, and we followed at a distance. The first thing he did, he stopped at the gun, smelt at it, but let it lie, and up he scrambles into the tree, climbing like a cat, though so monstrous heavy. 
I was amazed at the folly, as I thought it, of my man, and could not for my life see anything to laugh at, till seeing the bear get up the tree, we all rode near to him. When we came to the tree, there was Friday got out to the small end of a large branch, and the bear got about halfway to him. As soon as the bear got out to that part where the limb of the tree was weaker, Ha! says he to us. Now you see me teach you the bear dance. So he began jumping and shaking the bough, at which the bear began to totter, but stood still, and began to look behind him to see how he should get back. Then, indeed, we did laugh heartily. But Friday had not done with him by a great deal. When seeing him stand still, he called out to him again, as if he had supposed the bear could speak English. What? You come no farther? Pray you come farther! So he left jumping and shaking the tree, and the bear, just as if he understood what he said, did come a little farther. Then he began jumping again, and the bear stopped again. We thought now was a good time to knock him in the head, and called to Friday to stand still and we should shoot the bear. But he cried out earnestly, "'Oh, pray, oh, pray, no shoot! Me shoot by and then!' He would have said by and by. However, to shorten the story— Friday danced so much, and the bear stood so ticklish, that we had laughing enough, but still could not imagine what the fellow would do. For first we thought he depended upon shaking the bear off, and we found the bear was too cunning for that too. For he would not go out far enough to be thrown down, but clung fast with his great broad claws and feet, so that we could not imagine what would be the end of it, and what the jest would be at last. But Friday put us out of doubt quickly." for seeing the bear cling fast to the bough, and that he would not be persuaded to come any farther, "'Well, well,' says Friday, "'you come no farther, me go. You no come to me, me come to you.' And upon this he went out to the smaller end, where it would bend with his weight, and gently let himself down by it, sliding down the bough till he came near enough to jump down on his feet, and away he ran to his gun, took it up, and stood still. "'Well,' said I to him, "'Friday, what will you do now? Why don't you shoot him?' "'No shoot,' says Friday. "'No yet. Me shoot now, me no kill. Me stay, give you one more laugh.' And indeed so he did, for when the bear saw his enemy gone, he came back from the bough, where he stood, but did it very cautiously, looking behind him every step, and coming backward till he got into the body of the tree, then, with the same hinder end foremost, he came down the tree, grasping it with his claws, and moving one foot at a time, very leisurely. At this juncture, and just before he could set his hind foot on the ground, Friday stepped up close to him, clapped the muzzle of his piece into his ear, and shot him dead. Then the rogue turned about to see if we did not laugh, and when he saw we were pleased by our looks, he began to laugh very loud. "'So we kill bear in my country,' says Friday. "'So you kill them?' says I. "'Why, you have no guns.' "'No,' says he, "'no gun, but shoot great much long arrow.' This was a good diversion to us, but we were still in a wild place, and our guide very much hurt, and what to do we hardly knew. The howling of wolves ran much in my head, and indeed, except the noise I once heard on the shore of Africa— of which I have said something already, I never heard anything that filled me with so much horror. These things, and the approach of night, called us off, or else, as Friday would have had us, we should certainly have taken the skin of this monstrous creature off, which was worth saving, but we had near three leagues to go, and our guide hastened us, so we left him, and went forward on our journey. The ground was still covered with snow, though not so deep and dangerous as on the mountains, and the ravenous creatures, as we heard afterwards, were come down into the forest in plain country, pressed by hunger, to seek for food, and had done a great deal of mischief in the villages, where they surprised the country people, killed a great many of their sheep and horses, and some people, too. We had one dangerous place to pass, and our guide told us if there were more wolves in the country we should find them there, and this was a small plain, surrounded with woods on every side, and a long, narrow defile, or lane, which we were to pass to get through the wood, and then we should come to the village where we were to lodge. It was within half an hour of sunset when we entered the wood, and a little after sunset when we came into the plain, 
we met with nothing in the first wood, except that in a little plain within the wood, which was not above two furlongs over, we saw five great wolves cross the road full speed, one after another, as if they had been in chase of some prey, and had it in view. They took no notice of us, and were gone out of sight in a few moments. Upon this our guide, who, by the way, was but a faint-hearted fellow, bid us keep in a ready posture, for he believed there were more wolves a-coming. We kept our arms ready, and our eyes about us, but we saw no more wolves till we came through that wood, which was near half a league, and entered the plain. As soon as we came into the plain we had occasion enough to look about us. The first object we met with was a dead horse, that is to say, a poor horse which the wolves had killed, and at least a dozen of them at work, we could not say eating him, but picking his bones rather, for they had eaten up all the flesh before. We did not think fit to disturb them at their feast, neither did they take much notice of us. Friday would have let fly at them, but I would not suffer him by any means, for I found we were like to have more business upon our hands than we were aware of. We had not gone half over the plain when we began to hear the wolves howl in the wood on our left in a frightful manner, and presently after we saw about a hundred coming on directly towards us, all in a body, and most of them in a line, as regularly as an army drawn up by experienced officers. I scarce knew in what manner to receive them, but found to draw ourselves in a close line was the only way, so we formed in a moment, but that we might not have too much interval, I ordered that only every other man should fire, and that the others, who had not fired, should stand ready to give them a second volley immediately, if they continued to advance upon us, and then that those that had fired at first should not pretend to load their fusees again, but stand ready, every one with a pistol, for we were all armed with a fusee and a pair of pistols each man, so we were by this method able to fire six volleys, half of us at a time. However, at present we had no necessity, for upon firing the first volley, the enemy made a full stop, being terrified as well with the noise as with the fire. Four of them being shot in the head, dropped, several others were wounded, and went bleeding off, as we could see by the snow. I found they stopped, but did not immediately retreat. Whereupon, remembering that I had been told that the fiercest creatures were terrified at the voice of a man, I caused all the company to halloo as loud as they could, and I found the notion not altogether mistaken, for upon our shout they began to retire and turn about. I then ordered a second volley to be fired in their rear, which put them to the gallop, and away they went to the woods. This gave us leisure to charge our pieces again, and that we might lose no time, we kept going, but we had but little more than loaded our fusees, and put ourselves in readiness, when we heard a terrible noise in the same wood on our left, only that it was farther onward, the same way we were to go. The night was coming on, and the light began to be dusky, which made it worse on our side, but the noise increasing, we could easily perceive that it was the howling and yelling of those hellish creatures, and on a sudden we perceived three troops of wolves, one on our left, one behind us, and one in our front, so that we seemed to be surrounded with them. However, as they did not fall upon us, we kept our way forward, as fast as we could make our horses go, which, the way being very rough, was only a good hard trot. In this manner we came in view of the entrance of a wood, through which we were to pass, at the farther side of the plain. But we were greatly surprised, when coming nearer the lane or pass, we saw a confused number of wolves standing just at the entrance. On a sudden, at another opening of the wood, we heard the noise of a gun, and looking that way, out rushed a horse, with a saddle and a bridle on him, flying like the wind, and sixteen or seventeen wolves after him, full speed. The horse had the advantage of them, but as we supposed that he could not hold it at that rate, we doubted not but they would get up with him at last. No question, but they did. But here we had a most horrible sight, for riding up to the entrance where the horse came out, we found the carcasses of another horse and of two men, devoured by the ravenous creatures. And one of the men was no doubt the same whom we had heard fire the gun, for there lay a gun just by him, fired off. But as to the man, his head and the upper part of his body was eaten up. 
This filled us with horror, and we knew not what course to take. But the creatures resolved us soon, for they gathered about us presently, in hopes of prey, and I verily believe there were three hundred of them. It happened, very much to our advantage, that at the entrance into the wood, but a little way from it, there lay some large timber-trees, which had been cut down the summer before, and I suppose lay there for carriage. I drew my little troop in among those trees, and placing ourselves in a line behind one long tree, I advised them all to alight, and keeping that tree before us for a breastwork, to stand in a triangle, or three fronts, enclosing our horses in the centre. We did so, and it was well we did for never was a more furious charge than the creatures made upon us in this place. They came on with a growling kind of noise, and mounted the piece of timber, which, as I said, was our breastwork, as if they were only rushing upon their prey. And this fury of theirs, it seemed, was principally occasioned by their seeing our horses behind us. I ordered our men to fire as before, every other man, and they took their aim so sure that they killed several of the wolves at the first volley but there was a necessity to keep a continual firing, for they came on like devils, those behind pushing on those before. When we had fired a second volley of our fusees, we thought they stopped a little, and I hoped they would have gone off, but it was but a moment, for others came forward again. So we fired two volleys of our pistols, and I believe in these four firings we had killed seventeen or eighteen of them, and lamed twice as many. Yet they came on again." I was loath to spend our shot too hastily, so I called my servant, not my man Friday, for he was better employed, for, with the greatest dexterity imaginable, he had charged my fusee and his own while we were engaged. But, as I said, I called my other man, and giving him a horn of powder, I had him lay a train all along the piece of timber, and let it be a large train. He did so, and had but just time to get away, when the wolves came up to it, and some got upon it when I, snapping an uncharged pistol close to the powder, set it on fire. Those that were upon the timber were scorched with it, and six or seven of them fell, or rather jumped in among us with the force and fright of the fire. We dispatched these in an instant, and the rest were so frightened with the light, which the night, for it was now very near dark, made more terrible that they drew back a little, upon which I ordered our last pistols to be fired off in one volley, and after that we gave a shout. Upon this the wolves turned tail, and we sallied immediately upon near twenty lame ones that we found struggling on the ground, and fell to cutting them with our swords, which answered our expectation, for the crying and howling they made was better understood by their fellows, so that they all fled and left us. We had, first and last, killed about three score of them, and had it been daylight we had killed many more. The field of battle being thus cleared, we made forward again, for we still had near a league to go. We heard the ravenous creatures howl and yell in the woods as we went several times, and sometimes we fancied we saw some of them, but the snow dazzling our eyes we were not certain. In about an hour more we came to the town where we were to lodge, which we found in a terrible fright and all in arms, for, it seems, the night before the wolves and some bears had broken into the village, and put them in such terror that they were obliged to keep guard night and day, but especially in the night, to preserve their cattle, and indeed their people. The next morning our guide was so ill, and his limbs swelled so much with the rankling of his two wounds, that he could go no farther. So we were obliged to take a new guide here, and go to Toulouse, where we found a warm climate, a fruitful, pleasant country, and no snow, no wolves, nor anything like them. But when we told our story at Toulouse, they told us it was nothing but what was ordinary in the great forest at the foot of the mountains, especially when the snow lay on the ground. But they inquired much what kind of guide we had got who would venture to bring us that way in such a severe season, and told us it was surprising we were not all devoured. When we told them how we placed ourselves and the horses in the middle, they blamed us exceedingly, and told us it was fifty to one, but we had been all destroyed, for it was the sight of the horses which made the wolves so furious, seeing their prey, and that at other times they were really afraid of a gun. But being excessively hungry, and raging on that account, the eagerness to come at the horses had made them senseless of danger, 
and that if we had not by the continual fire, and at last by the stratagem of the train of powder, mastered them, it had been great odds but that we had been torn to pieces. Whereas, had we been content to have sat still on horseback, and fired as horsemen, they would not have taken the horses so much for their own, when men were on their backs, as otherwise. And withal, they told us that at last, if we had stood all together, and left our horses, they would have been so eager to have devoured them, that we might have come off safe, especially having our firearms in our hands, being so many in number. For my part, I was never so sensible of danger in my life, for, seeing above three hundred devils come roaring and open mouth to devour us, and having nothing to shelter us or retreat to, I gave myself over for lost, and, as it was, I believe I shall never care to cross those mountains again. I think I would much rather go a thousand leagues by sea, though I was sure to meet with a storm once a week. I have nothing uncommon to take notice of in my passage through France. Nothing but what other travellers have given an account of, with much more advantage than I can. I travelled from Toulouse to Paris, and without any considerable stay came to Calais, and landed safe at Dover the 14th of January, after having had a severe cold season to travel in. I was now come to the centre of my travels, and had in a little time all my new discovered estate safe about me, the bills of exchange which I brought with me having been currently paid. My principal guide and privy counsellor was my good ancient widow, who in gratitude for the money I had sent her, thought no pains too much, nor care too great, to employ for me, and I trusted her so entirely that I was perfectly easy as to the security of my effects, and indeed, I was very happy from the beginning, and now to the end, in the unspotted integrity of this good gentlewoman." And now, having resolved to dispose of my plantation in the Brazils, I wrote to my old friend at Lisbon, who, having offered it to the two merchants, the survivors of my trustees, who lived in the Brazils, they accepted the offer, and remitted thirty-three thousand pieces of eight to a correspondent of theirs at Lisbon to pay for it. In return I signed the instrument of sale in the form which they sent from Lisbon, and sent it to my old man, who sent me the bills of exchange for thirty-two thousand eight hundred pieces of eight for the estate, reserving the payment of one hundred moidores a year to him, the old man, during his life, and fifty moidores afterwards to his son for his life, which I had promised them, and which the plantation was to make good as a rent charge. And thus I have given the first part of a life of fortune and adventure, a life of Providence's checker-work, and of a variety which the world will seldom be able to show the like of, beginning foolishly, but closing much more happily than any part of it ever gave me leave so much as to hope for. Any one would think that in this state of complicated good fortune I was past running any more hazards, and so indeed I had been, if other circumstances had concurred, but I was inured to a wandering life, had no family, nor many relations, nor, however rich, had I contracted fresh acquaintance, and though I had sold my estate in the Brazils, yet I could not keep that country out of my head, and had a great mind to be upon the wing again, especially I could not resist the strong inclination I had to see my island, and to know if the poor Spaniards were in being there. My true friend, the widow, earnestly dissuaded me from it, and so far prevailed with me, that for almost seven years she prevented my running abroad, during which time I took my two nephews, the children of one of my brothers, into my care. The eldest, having something of his own, I bred up as a gentleman, and gave him a settlement of some addition to his estate, after my deceased. The other I placed with the captain of a ship, and after five years, finding him a sensible, bold, enterprising young fellow, I put him into a good ship, and sent him to sea, and this young fellow afterwards drew me in, as old as I was, to further adventures myself. In the meantime I in part settled myself here, for, first of all, I married, and that not either to my disadvantage or dissatisfaction, and had three children, two sons and one daughter, but my wife dying, and my nephew coming home with good success from a voyage to Spain, my inclination to go abroad, and his importunity, prevailed 
and engaged me to go in his ship as a private trader to the East Indies. This was in the year 1694. In this voyage I visited my new colony in the island, saw my successors the Spaniards, had the old story of their lives and of the villains I left there, how at first they insulted the poor Spaniards, how they afterwards agreed, disagreed, united, separated, and how at last the Spaniards were obliged to use violence with them, how they were subjected to the Spaniards, how honestly the Spaniards used them, a history, if it were entered into, as full of variety and wonderful accidents as my own part, particularly, also, as to their battles with the Caribbeans, who landed several times upon the island, and as to the improvement they made upon the island itself, and how five of them made an attempt upon the mainland, and brought away eleven men and five women prisoners, by which, at my coming, I found about twenty young children on the island. Here I stayed about twenty days, left them supplies of all necessary things, and particularly of arms, powder, shot, clothes, tools, and two workmen, which I had brought from England with me, that is, a carpenter and a smith. Besides this, I shared the lands into parts with them, reserved to myself the property of the whole, but gave them such parts respectively as they agreed on, and having settled all things with them, and engaged them not to leave the place, I left them there. From thence I touched at the Brazils, from whence I sent a bark, which I bought there, with more people to the island, and in it, besides other supplies, I sent seven women, being such as I found proper for service, or for wives to such as would take them. As to the Englishmen, I promised to send them some women from England, with a good cargo of necessaries, if they would apply themselves to planting, which I afterwards could not perform. The fellows proved very honest and diligent after they were mastered, and had their properties set apart for them. I sent them also, from the Brazils, five cows, three of them being big with calf, some sheep, and some hogs, which when I came again were considerably increased. But all these things, with an account how three hundred Caribbees came and invaded them, and ruined their plantations, and how they fought with that whole number twice, and were at first defeated, and one of them killed, but at last, a storm destroying their enemies' canoes, they famished or destroyed almost all the rest, and renewed and recovered the possession of their plantation, and still lived upon the island. All these things, with some very surprising incidents and some new adventures of my own, for ten years more, I shall give a farther account of, in the second part of my story. This is the end of The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. Thank you for listening.